Christian brother, <laughs> Brother Gene Di Lorenzo. He's going to share some information about the Christian brothers and particularly about Edmund Ignatius Rice and founded the order. So, without further ado, Gene. Right, okay. One of the questions I'm most at often asked is what is a brother? You think I need a mic? And ask <laughs> is, right, is what is a brother in traditional Catholic yeah, in traditional Catholic uh, religious language there are two states the clerical state and the lay state clerics mean ordained men someday it may include something else but <laughs> traditionally it's ordained men now religious life men and women who live in community and take vows, developed in the church in di different forms since about the third century. In Syria, of all places that we hear so much in the news, okay? in the deserts of Syria. There are some scholars who believe it was Buddhist monks who inspired the you way to go. Try that again. Some people believe it was Buddhist monks who inspired early people. Now, religious life from the beginning drew both those who were ordained and those who were not ordained. We live in community. We take vows, so-called evangelical councils, poverty, celibacy, and obedience. They're interpreted in many different ways in different orders. I belong to congregation of brothers who are active. We don't live in monasteries. In most cases, we no longer wear what I'm wearing. Because many of our brothers now can say, this is the garb of the cleric, our resident. Two clerics here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we don't wear, in most parts of the world, we don't wear. I tend to be one of the traditionalists, so I still wear. <laughs> Only because our founder fought for the right. Edmund Ignatius Rice, as you'll see in a few months in the movie, a uh, short movie I'm going to show, was a wealthy Irish businessman, married, the father of a retarded daughter. His wife died. We have no historical proof, but Patricia always said she died in a horse jumping accident, giving birth prematurely to a young girl. Mary, who uh, Edmund took care of all his life. They were only married two years. We're told he was quite, uh, what do you call it, the, like St. Francis in his early days, he knew many things about this world. Okay, and brings up. Uh, he was, his original idea after the death of his wife was to go to Europe and enter a monastery like his brother, who was an Augustinian priest. We're told, though, however, a woman friend of his pointed out the window of a house in Waterford, Island and said, look there. There are all the poor. They need you. You don't need to go to a monastery. This is part of our family history that we tell over and over again. Some of it's probably been, you know, jazzed up a little bit. Some of it's been turned into mythological stories. However, they're part of our history. The Ireland that Edmund was born in, and he was born in 1762, was an Ireland under British domination. It was an Ireland where Catholicism was illegal. It was, most of the Irish land was taken over by Brits some of whom never came to Ireland. They lived in England, but owned the land in Ireland. My, many of the farms were turned into sheep ranches. More money in wool than in potatoes. Okay. Edmund was a, not a very poor man, though. His family owned 160 acres. It was quite a large amount of land in his day. So he himself 
didn't grow up in a, in a what do you call it, a very poor situation. However, three years after his birth, in the town next to him, a priest was captured by the British, hung and drawn and quartered, stretched out and pulled apart because it was illegal. Edmund went to school in what are called the Hedge Schools. A young Franciscan friar used to come sneak into the village and taught, not in the village, but in the hedges, under the trees, outside the city walls. And that's where Edmund was trained. He then was apprenticed to his uncle, Michael, in the city of Waterford, and eventually became quite a wealthy man in modern terms of a millionaire. Uh, he never remarried, and his retarded daughter, Mary, was raised by his stepsister, Joan. Uh, we've lost track of where she, what happened to her, but we know she lived to be like 80 years old, according to our records. In the parlance of the time, in our early records, it says the congregation was to submit five pounds annual for the idiot. Remember, read that stuff. Yeah. You know, it's just, it was language not used today, but in those days, the same way Edmund bought a young black student off a ship in Waterford Harbor. One of the slaves on, a, on an American ship and turned, uh, set, set him free. We call that man again in Nakam, Black Johnny. And he. He was set up as a merchant by Edmund, freed and set up as a merchant. And one of the oldest black family, black Irish families, is actually descended from Black Johnny. Uh, he also set up the first stagecoach system by an Italian who lived in Ireland. So Edmund, from his early days, was very much concerned with others. And eventually he will begin to teach. And his order began with himself in a livery stable with three other men who only lasted two weeks. The work was too hard. I mean, this is not the Ireland of, you know, the, the quiet man. This is the Ireland of the slums. This is the Ireland of kids, thousands of orphans in the streets of the major cities of Ireland, some who had little or no chance of anything. Edmund, from his early days, decided the best thing to do was to educate them. And we became the great educators of Ireland. In your packet there, in the last two pages, I show you what began with that one man in 1802 in a livery stable in Dublin, excuse me, in Waterford. We've spread all over the world. We're in 32 countries now. I've listed most of them. Some cases are only one or two brothers. My, one of my best friends works in southern Sudan. We Americans can't go there. He's a Canadian. Okay. No, it's not, it's not very safe. We, uh, our newest community was just in the Philippines, was somewhat uh, injured by the, the earthquake recently. No. And we came here to the United States originally in 1880 into western uh, Massachusetts. But the Irish didn't get along with the American kids. They only lasted 13 months. And they went back to Ireland. And we returned here in 1906. Some of you older ones may have remembered a school, Power Memorial. It was named after Monsignor Power, who brought us to, uh, uh, to New York. That was. Uh, Kareem Javar's high school, Lou Alcindor. Okay. Someone mentioned George Carlin earlier today. George Carlin was one of our students too in Cardinal Hayes High School in the Bronx. Uh, Mel Gibson was also one of our students, but in Australia. His father fled the United States with his family. He was from New York, and he, he went to our schools in, in what do you call it, Australia. So without further ado, I just want to show this little film about Edmund and the beginnings of our work.
all the brothers are going to fear speaking here are all dead except one. founded the Congregation of Christian Brothers in Waterford in Southern Ireland. Francis, son of a wealthy cloth merchant, enjoyed a charmed youth. After a bout with illness, he was suddenly seized with devotion to God and to the poor. St. Francis of Assisi placed poverty above all else. For poverty, he renounced everything that can make life seem attractive and bore witness for the poor. In our own day, Mother Teresa follows in the footsteps of St. Francis. In 1946, after many years as a teaching religious, Mother Teresa asked for permission to work among the poor in the slums of India. From her convent window, she witnessed the shocking poverty and squalor of the slums. The sick people who remain unattended, lonely men and women lying on the pavement, and thousands of orphan children with no one to care for them. In 1948, she put on the cheap Indian sari and began her direct service to the poor, the sick, and the dying. In every age, God selects from among his children certain ones whose lives embody the principles of the gospel in a striking manner. It's the first painting. Edmund, Edmund Rice, the, brother, he to the founder of the Christian Brothers, was such a one. A man of wealth and social prestige, he married, became a father and a widower. He was an educator and a servant of the cross. Brother Rages Hickey from Australia, an authority on the life of Brother Rice, begins the story. Edmund Rice was born before the American Revolution in the 1760s, as a matter of fact. Born in a town called Callum, where his father had a farm, and I suppose his childhood was reasonably privileged, which was quite different from the condition of most Catholics in the island of his time, because the penal laws were still in force, and many were still laboring under severe disadvantages. It was in this neat thatched farmhouse in Callan, County Mayo, in 
County Kilkenny, where in June 1762, Edmund Rice was born. It was a small oasis of prosperity and comfort in the bleak and general desert of poverty and misery. The Rices were better off than their poor neighbors, and on their 160-acre farm, they produced most of their needs in food and clothing material. In the evening, the Rice family gathered around the blazing fire and listened to the news of the area. If these stout walls could speak, they would echo stories or how bounty hunters had taken Father Sheehan to be hanged, drawn, and quartered in nearby Clonmel in 1766. There were tales of the poor of the area who had lost their land and headed for cities and towns, there to find starvation and death in their filthy hovels. It was here within this home that Edmund's character was formed. His mother taught him love for the poor and instilled a devotion to Jesus and Mary. The little gray friar, Father John Grace, helped educate Edmund, and later on, Edmund joined his uncle in business. After Edmund's schooling, he uh, joined his uncle in Waterford. The picture behind me here is a print of Waterford taken during, made during the founder's lifetime. And for several years, Edmund worked here as a businessman. His place of business uh, was very close to here. Uh, if you go to Waterford now, you'll notice some changes. But uh, where his house is, the place where his shop is, uh, can still be identified. And he lived there for several years. Uh, when he was in his mid-twenties, he married a girl called Mary Elliot, uh, but she died within two years, leaving him an invalid daughter. He cared for that daughter very well throughout the whole of his life. And he continued with his business, but making money, just for the sake of making money, uh, lost a lot of its attraction and he continually looked around for ways of helping people, and in particular, helping the many poor boys who were in the locality of Waterford. The old city of Waterford, with its hundreds of sailing ships, has given way to a new one. Gone is the bustling dockside which Edmund's meat and provision business supplied. But the city remembers with reverence his place of business near the docks and his residence close by. Fittingly enough, his home at 3 Arundel Lane has been converted partially into a butcher shop. In this fine house, Edmund lived with his daughter and stepsister after his wife died while he sought signs of God's will for his future life. The narrow alleyway to St. Patrick's Church where Edmund worshipped left no doubt of the inferior status of the Catholics at the time. The process of helping the young boys of Waterford, he realized that the best help that he could give them would be the help uh, that would improve them as human beings, the help that would make them aware of their own dignity both as human beings and as sons of God. And so he saw that the best way to do this was by Christian education. He wanted to help them to eventually help themselves. And so he devoted a lot of his own money to opening up schools. And the very first school that he opened, he opened without any brothers to assist him. He did pay some teachers but they found the work so difficult that very soon they left him and there he was on his own. But undaunted he continued until some young men came and asked could they join him, not for pay, but to be religious like himself. 
Uh, Edmund's first school would have been among the buildings here in what was an old livery stable. Later, Edmund opened the school down there where he used to have his business, what's now called St. Patrick's School. It uh, is no longer functioning, but functioning as a school, but the site is still there. And then in 1802 or three, Edmund built a monastery and school just near the Belly Britain Church here on a site which since then has been called Mount Sinai. He asked the bishop for permission to take vows so that they could be religious. Because Edmund was not just a social reformer, he, above all things, was a man who wanted to lead the people of the new church into closer union with God. And in 1808, with the permission of the bishop, the brothers took their first vows, and at that stage of our history, uh, we were known as Presentation Brothers because we adopted the world of the Presentation Sisters who had been working among the four girls of Waterford and Cork and Dublin and many other Irish cities uh, for the previous 30 years. But uh, a little gateway to history, really, the entrance to that compound of St. Patrick. And here we move up along past the shops and the houses that hidden this little compound and we move to the modern opening that has been made of this little historical landmark in this very ancient city, St. Patrick. St. Patrick Church, founded in 1760, manned by the Jesuit Fathers until 1798. The siege, I think, of the inspiration, much of the inspiration, to the founding of the Christian Brothers and the Presentation Brothers in Ireland, who would work in the spirit of Edward Rice, spreading the gospel, bringing hope and opportunity to broken people everywhere. The inspiration that just was had to the name of Ignatius, which is religious name. Here we're in a very old church in New York, 1750, I think it was built. This is St. Patrick. St. Patrick is a bishop. A few years ago, the whole population was there in the Israeli and there was talk of not to take that much. I think it would have been a historical strike. Because St. Patrick was the seat of the Soviet Union, the speaker of the Soviet Union, this part of the heart of the Soviet Union. Edward Rice didn't go to try, Edward Rice part of the Possibly in this little church in a very poor neighborhood, we met the broken, the third world of the war of the time. The people who were dispossessed, the people who had no hope in life, are what we want. I think that the work of God is the first day. I think that it was all on the people. Certainly, in the church, what to this church is that we pray for seeking by all and the will of God to give on that two congregations, two brotherhoods out of the five brotherhoods that came up in the first 30 years of the 19th century that that could be the will of God for the father and the breath the new way of the gospel the way that was inspired by this church and by the name of the this church Still, we have the northern wall of the city. Inside this wall was respectability, you could say. Up beyond that wall were the pool to rise. Roman people on a street called Barry Street has two barracks, a horse soldier's barrack, a foot soldier's barrack, to keep the peace among them. These were the boys who came into work in the industry to attend the school in the industry. The people of New Street objected to the presence of these poor and ruling boys, and eventually he knew he'd have to do what the sisters did, go outside the walls where those people lived, 
a little bit. And here is the site of the chapel of the Monastery. In that chapel lies David's cross town. And there's a plaque here that commemorates the making of cross towns in 1807 by Edward Rice and seven of his brothers. Later, when he came outside the wall himself, he took a portion of the land and up on the hill there to our left, he built Mount Zion. It was at Mount Zion that the growing enterprise became a religious congregation in 1808 as the Presentation Brothers, attracting mature men who gave up promising careers to follow his example. The school quickly became a success. By 1816, it voted the student body of 600 poor boys. On Mount Sion stands the beautiful chapel of the Blessed Sacrament. It is the final resting place of Edmund. Edmund was faced with trials and contradictions. But his life was centered in Jesus, in the tabernacle. And it was there he received the strength to carry out his calling. Facere et Cochere, to do and to teach. How did Edmund teach? The three R's were important, but the fundamental purpose of education was and is to train a man how to live and not merely how to make a living. What did Edmund do? He took the words of St. Matthew literally. As long as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. His acts of charity extended from the classroom to the shriveling poverty of the suffering poor. Moving now toward the big house. Really reconstruct the big house and tailored workshop. Mr. Rice is living in the gospel wider possibly than the way we live it today. But more and more we're coming back to the fullness of the Gospels he lived in. He was a man who really was aware of the sorrows and difficulties of the world, who was aware of his duty as a Christian, who really believed that to be a Christian was to find Christ and serve Christ, that Christ in others. And therefore, thanks be to God, in the years past, the danger of this little building did not. But thank God that he survived and they have rebuilt it as it would have been possibly in time with the lands. And here he had close to the boundary a big house and a table shop. Downstairs here, next door, we find the big house he constructed. Often he found that when he went down to the little lanes to ask the parents to send the children to the school. You wouldn't believe it, they'd say, Mr. Rice would send the boy up, but we just don't have any clothes. The children then came up to school, and on their way home, they called into the bakery here, and every child brought home a loaf of bread to the family. Possibly the only meal that family had to the day. He was packed with charity, feeding uh, the body and eating as it were, after feeding the mind and the soul, and giving the opportunity to rise. Here we are in the reconstructed tailor shop. We even know the names of the tailors. One of them, his name was Flavin. It's tremendously interesting, there's still some of the Flavins going to school here. And when this shop was reconstructed, the people of all wanted to be part of it. And they looked around in the attic of their houses, and they came up with a knife like this, and they came up with this little instrument here for, for the making of clothes, and thread and spool of the cloth at the time, and the cloth of the tailor, and the little measuring rod, so that they would be part of this legal structure of the practical charity of this is taught in that, this little tailor shop. On the wall, you read, not only did Brother Rice, impart religious and secular education to the young and the old, but he supplied 
souls to those who require him. He also fed the hungry. You're dealing all the time with this man with big streams, as you're dealing all with the great men, as you're dealing with Mother Teresa today. They live the gospel gradually. They live it as Christ asked us to live it. This then is the river hill, St. John's Hill, and this is a bridge over on the river here, a very, very ancient bridge indeed. This bridge will go back to the 1300s. And uh, why do we have a picture? Because public executions were held on that bridge because one of the jails of water was quite close. And we know from the history of the congregation, a part of the, the apostolic work of, of Mr. Rice was attending to these poor men who were due for public execution on this bridge. This is a leaf from his account books. This is a very interesting one because it says here uh, a page from Edmund Rice's account book in his hand, 1824. And there you see what he did with the money. For example, he was dealing with 68 pounds for treatment. And right down the line, you find small sums of money one pound, two pounds. For example, here, to Mary, monthly a widow, six shillings. He knew Mary monthly. He knew her neighbor that her mother was a very monthly, and he knew she was a widow. So he was a man who was giving charity, was giving knocked up to people, and giving to her sins. He was a man then who really was close to the Lord, and I think that was a dream today. He was selling to Christ to these people. You have down here uh, so much money uh, to a family who released their clothes from, from the farm office. They would be poor, they would put their, their poor clothes in place in the farm office. And probably this time of the year, uh, probably cold, uh, that particular time of the year, maybe it was through January actually, they would need their clothes. And they didn't have the money to redeem them. And part of this confidentiality it extends to the fact that he knew the position of his family and that he was quite willing to buy his clothes back from the hospital. Here then, in what's left of the original Mount Zion, is a very lovely reconstruction of the bedroom of Edward Rice. A man who, by the way, had his own silver in the morning. Silver is raised with the initial PR. And uh, a man who gave all that of a room like this. And just a table, a stool, a bed, and of course the text, text of the Bible. He read the love for the Bible. And when he was an old man, the young adults would help him up the stairs and would fix the Bible in the winter time. And he'd sit down on the stool, he'd open the whole book with the big print, and he would write for the day. Write for the day. I just hope to have an old man That's the way I write the old man. It's going to be reading the Bible. <coughs> At his death, the institute he founded was a papal congregation since 1820, and had spread throughout Ireland, and now was established in England. About a First month after Edmund's death in 1844, Father Richard Fitzgerald spoke these words to an overflowing crowd in Waterford's Cathedral. Need I say that he needs not the aid of a sculptor or painter, for as long as gratitude shall find a place in the Irish heart, and as long as religion shall be revered among us, as long as civilization shall be prized and cherished, as long as patriotism shall be accounted a virtue, the name of Edmund Rice will be held in benediction. Today, Brother Ed Repke and Mr. Pat Fanning echo these words on Mount Sinai. I think we're now on another upswing. Uh, the work of the congregation is still going forward. Uh, in the United States, you get the feeling when you talk with others of uh, energy and excitement and enthusiasm for the work that we start spreading into other areas. Uh, the schools are all active, vital places. I think if Edmund were around today, He'd be very proud of what's going on. I don't think he'd sit back saying, you lost what I wanted to do. I think he would feel that we've been very faithful to him. But after listening and reading and thinking and praying, 
I come back to the conclusion that for me, and I think for most of the brothers in the congregation, the work is still going to be teaching. Teaching the poor, teaching them to bring themselves up, uh, preparing them to carry on with Christ as a center for their life.
Mandy's oldest son, he's a graduate of our school. In Peru, South America, the brothers in New Jersey, the poorest of the poor, and also in school so have you, have you, some of you remember the movie Alive? from the Pacific Ocean of the, the Amazon jungle. That was our school. The, they were from all boys from our school. To technical or trade away. school. That the brothers bring the hope Andes. of a brighter future to the children of parents just who earn 25 cents a day and they live in straw The two pictures, the one on the top, it's not well produced, is the banner of Edmund Rice was beatified. And assume directorship of Boys Town in Rome, Italy. Process for the foundation in the year John Paul II. That was the banner that was exposed for all. This one on the bottom is one picture the brothers don't like. Which shows Ten you years ago, we exhumed the body of Ed Price to rebury it. Experts no from the FBI were put in to do forensic evaluation. This, in boys town, this is the face of Ed Price, as far as we believe. The past, they don't like, they like the world of the highest smile. smile. <laughs> Uh, very quickly, there was an article that appeared in American magazine. There's another one. The the of a There's a little list of important dates. In Italy. Uh, the the also, there's a holy picture there. Desmond Klein, an Irish uh, what do you call it? iconographer, but does not work in paint. He writes in glass. The of their and this is the, the, the this is what, this is the, what do you call it? The icon of Edmund that he produced. And there's a description of it. Here you and an educated and cared for poor and just experienced the unconditional love of God. We were an Irish order, so there's our the crest. But we've changed. You know, as I'm wearing something a little different. This is our new logo. We're no longer an Irish order. I'm De Lorenzo, not an Irish. Our superior general is an Indian. Our sub-superior general is from Sierra Leone. There is not an Irishman on our council anymore in Rome. Okay. We become each now. So here, here's the Celtic cross. By now, it's been open. The circle has been open. And there's new leaves. Uh, our latest brothers. We have brothers with bones in their noses. In Papua New Guinea, strangest thing ever saw. Someone with a collar on, with a pig bone. <laughs> Those. My friend, brother Simon. Uh, then I'm showing there are a couple of new icons of Edmund. A little different picture. There's Edmund Rodney, defining an African motif from our African brothers. And then one of Edmund in an Indian. Sorry, that's not very good. In an Indian pose. International today. And then you can see where we are all over the world. Our earliest students were not always Catholic. Edmund got in trouble because he opened a school for British students right in Waterford, teaching the Irish poor, and he taught the sons of soldiers, British soldiers. Okay. Thank you very much. There's a light in pictures of a particular Christian brother, me. <laughs> From cradle, not to grave yet. <laughs> Thank you very much.